Yesterday, the crowds were drawn to the Route de Tour, where Greg LeMond answered their call. Today, France celebrates Bastille Day as the race enters the heart of Brittany, France's cycling mecca. Greg LeMond, after his time trial yesterday, again in yellow. The colour he feels suits him best. The Bastille Day stays left Alençon this morning just after midday under cloudy and grey skies and a chill air. Perhaps these will be the perfect conditions to attack the 161 kilometres to Rennes. Hello again. The second week of the Tour de France begins and Greg LeMond already in yellow, but far from certain of victory in this race yet. Behind me, the finish line here in Rennes awaits the winner of today's stage, and I'm quite sure the majority of the spectators here will hope he's French, especially on Bastille Day. But you know, yesterday in the time trial, there were many riders who believe they can't win the Tour de France, and they didn't try too hard. So it's reasonable to expect that they will go out on the attack as well today. But whichever way you look at it, you know, there'll be two winners of the Tour today, one of the stage here in Rennes, and one of you. Thanks a lot for your sacks of mail for our competition. By the end of the day, one of you will have a yellow jersey autographed by the leader tonight and by today's stage winner. Well, the Tour de France, the first week is over. It's been one of controversy, happiness, and indeed for Rolf Sorensen, one of sadness. Here's Gary Imlach with his review of this first week. Saturday may have seen the start of a new tour, but it was an old result in the prologue. Thierry Marie winning the opening time trial, just like he did last year and in 1986. That was good news for Greg LeMond. Every time Marie wins the prologue, he seems to win the tour. LeMond settled into third place behind the man tipped as his big rival this year, Eric Breuking. On the first stage proper, the defending champion slipped into the yellow jersey almost by mistake, as the threat of a crash forced him to move forward out of harm's way. Do you think that's good for you for the rest of the tour? You better believe it. a sporting cliché from elsewhere, it was a day of two halves, and the second half belonged to Rolf Sorensen, who despite crashing won the team time trial with his Ariostia teammates and took the race lead in his first Tour de France. It's kind of a dream coming to me. It's the first, my first tour and the second day of my first tour, so it's very nice. The day was a nightmare, though, for Stephen Roach, who turned up late for the team time trial because of a mix-up over the start time and was eliminated from the race. Stage three, Jose Manuel Oliveira demonstrated the art of delivering seven bottles to your teammates when you've only got two pockets. 
while Stephen Hodge of Omte went one better, auditioning for a career in television at the same time. It was a painful end to the stage for the world champion Rudy Darnans, down at the finish, but not, thankfully, out of the race. Stage four to the world champagne capital Reims was the longest of the tour, 286 hot kilometers. Stephen Hodge, though, was more worried about his public. The flies get on Australian TV. Claudio Cipucci attacked for the second day running, but the race came down to a sprint finish, with Johan Muzo literally pushed into second place by the physical Abdu Japarov. It's always the same with him. Yesterday I do it with, uh, with Ludwig, today with me, uh, it's not fair. The race leader Rolf Sorensen seemed obsessed with his headgear on Wednesday morning. Unfortunately, when he crashed three kilometers from home, it was his collarbone that sustained the damage although he bravely finished the stage on a borrowed bike. of the finish no one knew who the race leader was and for once the leader's podium was dismantled with no presentation of the yellow jersey in fact it still belonged to Sorensen but only technically his collarbone was broken and his debut tour was over Jersey up for grabs on his home turf of Normandy, Thierry Marie launched the second longest breakaway in tour history, more than 230 kilometers from the finish. It paid off. By the time the race hit La Havre, he would have the race lead for the second time in a week. While Thierry Marie was mobbed by ecstatic Normans, Robert Miller was limping in after a crash. How damaged are you? Will you be all right for tomorrow, Robert? I don't know. I can't turn my head to the left, so... Maybe I'll need an osteopath and then put it back in place. Robert may have been in better physical shape the next morning, but his image was in tatters. At least he was able to continue, though. All in all, it was a bad week for injuries. Fabio Parra crashed out on the road to Argentan. Greg Lamont felt moved to deliver a bilingual road safety lecture to a French motorcyclist. Hey, better watch out. You're very dangerous. No traffic problems for the defending champion yesterday, though. Le Mans taking over a minute off Eric Broikink in the time trial, and Yellow for the second time in a week.
Right, well, let's have a look now at how we line up for this second week of the Tour de France. Greg Le Mans wearing the yellow jersey after 31 hours and 57 minutes of riding. Up into second place is Eric Broikink. The sprinter, Jamaluddin Abdu Jakarov, proving to us now he can also ride a time trial, holds third. Miguel Indurain is fourth, and Jean-Francois Bernard is fifth. Sean Kelly in sixth place. What a great tour the man is having at 35 years of age. Gianni Bugno, a pre-race favourite, up into seventh place. Raul Alcala is ninth. Pedro Delgado, 12th, and Laurent Fignon, 14th. Of the rest, Claudio Chiapucci in 20th place. Remember, he finished second a year ago. Gertian Ternisa is 47th. Johan Brunil, 59th. Lucho Herrera, 61st. And Robert Miller is 134th. But, of course, he's not planning to win the Tour de France. He's looking for a victory in the stages in the Pyrenees. Well, the big loser yesterday, I suppose, is Eric Broikink. He seemed to be set to win the time trial, and then he came to the finish, he really hit the wall, and he collapsed. Later in the programme, he'll be explaining what happened to Paul Sherwin, and just how now he's going to handle Greg LeMond as we head off towards the mountains. Gary Imlach will also update us with our rookie, Lawrence Roach. Here's the route the riders face. It's 161 kilometres to Rennes today. No hills of note. Three bonus sprints on the way. It could be a day for the long attack or indeed a day for the sprinter. Well, the first bonus sprint today happened very soon after the start, only eight kilometres down the road, out of Alençon, and Abdu Japarov was sharpening his sprinter's legs again, ahead of Johan Museu, his arch-rival, and Lon Jalabert of the Toshiba team. So Abdu Japarov now, uh, just a couple of seconds away from going back into second place in this Tour de France. But at the second sprinter, Juvignet, at 96 kilometres, Henri Abadie had attacked and had established a lead of about a minute. He was heading Konishev of the Soviet Union, the first Russian to win a stage of Tour de France, which he did last year at Po. And in third place, Kardinat was in third spot there. That's the situation at the moment. The race today on very pleasant undulating countryside here in Brittany. And the clouds are still with us and the riders on attacking mode well that sprint was at 96 kilometers and the race is now at 110 kilometers covered 50 kilometers to go to the finish and these two riders are together Henri Abadie of France at the back of the two here and Connie Chev the rider who broke his collarbone rather badly in the Tour of Spain now the first time we've seen him in fact in the Tour de France on the attack today a bit further behind them by a minute and five seconds. We've got the Italian Lelli from the Ariostia team and Thierry Bourguignon of the French Top Seba team. He's along as the policeman to try and stop the gap closing down on his teammate here, Henri Abadie. And then the main peloton, as you can see, at one minute, 17 seconds. The caption here, in fact, giving us a name that has not been confirmed in that chase group. As far as we know, it is Thierry Bourguignon in the chase group with Lelli. Now, just before we join the action here today on the road to end, one or two questions, and thank you for all your questions. The first question that everybody has asked, it seems, is how do the riders take a natural break, on, especially on an eight-hour day in the Tour de France? Well, they slip to the back of the field, and they ask a couple of teammates to push them along. And if it's a major problem, well, they do what anybody else would do on the open road. They'd nip off behind the hedge. Now, lots are asking about the dark-haired girl, too, who presents the yellow jersey to the winners, uh, uh, the stage readers, race winners and the overall leader every night. Well, the answer is we don't know her name, but Paul Showins promised to find it out for us. And what is the cost of team sponsorship in the Tour de France? Well, these professional teams now run on fairly high budgets. Uh, a big team with the top riders can range anywhere between 2 to £3.5 million pounds a year. And is throwing hands in the air at the finishing lines dangerous and illegal? Dangerous? Well, I don't think so, because we don't see any crashes caused by it. Illegal, yes, it is against international rules, and riders in the past have been disqualified from the stage victory. Uh, but providing no danger is created, the race referees usually allow it to pass by. And those of you who have inquired after the health of Marshal Guéant, who had two crashes, the second one taking him out of the Tour de France on the road to Le Havre, He's fine, but of course he has retired from the race. Those of you asking technical questions about gears, bicycles, pedals and ratios, well, we decided there are so many of you inquiring, we will do a special report on that uh, during the next couple of weeks. Let's now join the action, Paul. This is the chase group, and here is Lely, who's been quite a sensation his first Tour de France.
Well, he was a, he's been quite a sensation in this race as well as also in the Tour of Italy because he was the best young rider in the Tour of Italy just recently, finishing third overall. These two riders who were away before were Lely and Thierry Bourguignon, but they've been joined by six others. This rider now, the Toshiba rider, is Laurent Jalabert. Also there is the Brazilian rider, Ribeiro. An interesting rider here is uh, Johan Brunil, who did a very bad time in the time trial yesterday. One of the favourites for the top 15 for this year's Tour de France, and number 52 there from the uh, from the Gatorade team is Calcaterra, and also in the group there was Edwig van Hoydonk. Well, this is a good chase group, this. It's only just got off the front of the main field, and certainly Toshiba today have been the animators of the stage. They've finally got a man away in Henri Abadi, and for those of you who've taken... Uh, your guess at the winner today. I bet not many have put that name down for victory, but you should have thought about it on Bastille Day. It's odds on a Frenchman would be in the frame and Aberdeen up the road at the moment. But a good chase group forming behind. And at the moment, the leaders of the tour not taking a great interest. Well, I think they've probably most of them got sore legs from yesterday because a lot of riders rode very, very hard in that time trial yesterday. It was a lot of surprises. Some riders lost a great deal of time, and I think. Riders like Johan Brunel are trying to slip into a move like this today to put themselves back into contention because six and seven minutes is the time that was lost by many of these riders. And you can see the main field here stringing out because they don't want to let the breakaways go clear and everybody chasing, trying to bring everything back together again. Well, this is a very compact little group trying to speed away from the field. The overall time spread we got was one minute, 17 seconds. I would suspect that this chase group is starting to eat into the lead of the men out on the road. 50 seconds are saying now to the pursuers. There's a shot of Greg LeMond in his yellow jersey and riding near the front of the peloton. It's only a short stage for the boys in the Tour de France today. It's only a mere 161 kilometers and so they do seem prepared to race the distance. Well, they are racing the distance, that's for sure. And I think a little bit helped by the fact that it's cooler today. So everybody wants to have a good attack and try and break away, get up there and show themselves on Bastille Day. One other rider in that group, by the way, who I didn't manage to tell you about was Guido Bontempi from the Carrera team, and he's a very good sprinter. And he's having a very good season, too. He's uh, won stages in the Tour of Italy, won two stages in the Tour of uh, Spain, rather, and he won them well from the bunches and from a, a breakaway. And a very dangerous man, indeed, in that front group. There's a nice shot of the big peloton as they go through the S's here. So oh, the whole field riding compactly. Good rows today. There is one or two little problems on the run in uh, through Wren itself. But basically the riders will be happy out here. These are the two leaders hanging on to a very tenuous lead. I don't think they'll survive all the way to Wren. We've still got 45 kilometers to go. So we'll take a break. Welcome back to the Tour de France. Well, yesterday it was the crucial 73 kilometers time trial. And everybody here on the tour reckoned that Eric Broeking would be the next man to wear the leader's yellow jersey. It certainly seemed that way too for most of the ride. He was leading at every time check. And then in the last 10 kilometers, he cracked. Well, even so, he came up to second overall. He's still the main challenger to Greg LeMond's yellow jersey. And here's Gary Imlach to trace his career for us. <laughs> On his first tour in 1987, Broeking recorded a stage win at Poe. Since then, the time trial specialist has been steadily improving his all-round riding to the point where he's many people's pick for the tour itself. In 1988, he won the white jersey for the best young rider in the race, and in 1989 took the yellow jersey in the prologue, only to abandon two weeks later exhausted. Last year's tour was his best ever. He won two of the three time trials and finished third overall. It could have been even better had he not punctured at the start of a bad stage to Luc Sardin as Greg LeMond had his best day of the tour. This year there were shades of LeMond about his performance in the Tour du Pont, where he came from 50 seconds back to win the race on the final time trial. Eric Kruking, the champion of the 1991 Tour du Pont. Eric, everybody expected you to beat Greg LeMond in the time trial, and in fact, at every intermediary time you were leading him oh. until 10 kilometers to go. Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, the engine stopped there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, most of the times, the last 10, 20 kilometers are the most important of the time trial. And then I was uh, 
I was feeling very good still, still at the top of the hill. And I thought after that it's not so difficult anymore, but in the last eight kilometers was a lot of wind. And I didn't, I forced a little bit too much on the last hill, I think. I heard that I was 30 seconds in lead and then I was a little bit too. You went, you went too hard because some people, some of the Dutch journalists said maybe you had some kind of glucose exhaustion at the end. Yeah, that may be also uh, a part of it, uh, the combination of going too fast and then a little bit too less uh, glucose and then just losing a lot of time. Is that a big worry for you because now you're 1 minute 17 seconds behind Le Monde in the yeah. overall classification? I still, I was fourth in the, in the time trial, I won time on the others only on Indurain and Le Mans, so it's not so bad, and I'm in second position. It's, it's only beginning, uh, the mountains are coming, so... A lot of people say you, uh, you personally always have a bad day in the Tour de France. Do you think the time trial was your bad day? Yeah, let's say that, then uh, we have had it, but... <laughs> there are a lot of riders who are going to want to attack in the mountains, Gianni Bugno, Delgado, Indurain. Yeah. Will you um, will you try and attack when you come to the Pyrenees? Yeah, when that, that depends on the course and how you feel. But uh, yeah, I will not stay in second position and do nothing because then it's easy for London. But I can maybe uh, yeah when the others uh, like uh, Delgado and Bugno and when they attack uh, Le Mans had to chase them and maybe I can take advantage of that. So you think a lot of riders are going to attack Le Mans? Yeah, because they're a lot of time behind, and uh, three, four minutes already now after uh, after one week is a lot, and uh, one minute is not so much. Do you see there being a big uh, a big amount of pressure from the Banesto team because they have three riders very well placed? Yeah, that's right, and I think Indran is the the best rider of that team, and yeah, we watch that team, and we have maybe in the in Alcala is in that position also, uh, three, four minutes, so and Kelly. You can play with them also. And here, the leading group has swelled somewhat in the last couple of kilometres because when we crossed the town of Vitre, up came eight more riders, and now we have a leading group of ten, and they are going clear. The last time check we had was two minutes thirty seconds. Edric van Hooydonk here. This is Lely, the leading young rider in the Tour de France this year. Johan Brunel in the pink top to his. Jersey and Paul you've got the full list there well the full list as we look at the main field here who don't really seem to be reacting at the moment you've got all the team cars trying to go by so they can give their information through but Henri Abadie is there uh, also Konichev the Russian rider the first Russian to ever win a stage in the Tour de France Lely is there he's quite dangerous because he's lying in 24th place overall at the moment and he's a very good uh, rider for the overall classification he could gain some time back Thierry Bourguignon Johan Brunel is there from the Lotto team. Another man who's one of our favourites to finish in the top 15. Laurent Jalabert, the, the uh, French sprinter, is there also. Ribeiro, the rider from Brazil, riding from the RMO squad. Edward van Hooydonk, the rider from Buckler, the team who always likes to ride well on the flat stages. Number 61 there is, in fact, uh, Johan Brunel, just taking a little bit of a rest. To finish off the two Italians, Calcaterra from the Gatorade Chateau Dax, the rider in the green jersey, just sliding back there. And then also a rider we can't quite see, but I know he's there, Guido Bontempi. And there is a reaction from the bunch. Greg Lamont has moved up to the front, and it looks as though the Z team are happy to ride along here. Keep an eye on the big leaders in the main field, and the Buckle team are also coming to the front because they have their man. Edwig van Hooyedonk in the lead, the winner this year of the Tour of Flanders. Looks like he's coming back onto form. Well, definitely. There's, there's no real reaction. I think all the movement we can see is because the team cars, as you can see, are trying to go by so that they can go and talk to their riders in the front. There are a lot of the riders who are represented in that breakaway. Their teammates are here trying to slow it down. On the right there, the Carrera riders, a Toshiba rider, an RMO rider. Also, well, sorry about the breakup, but the Buckler riders are also omnipresent there. So they're doing everything they can to try and intimidate everybody and stop any organized chase taking place well the rider i think paul who's going to see this as something of a bonus on the flat route to ren is johan brunel he's lost a bit of time including in a time trial yesterday we're expecting him to really excel in the mountains in his first tour de france last year he rode so well but he's going to the mountains with quite a deficit on greg lamont 
Well, he's nine and a half minutes down on Greg LeMond already, and as I say, most of that was lost in the time trial yesterday when he lost over six minutes. Also, Massimilio uh, Lelli would like to gain a little bit of time because he's not too bad in the mountains either. So those are the two riders likely to gain from this breakaway. The other riders obviously thinking about a stage victory because a stage victory is a real, uh, a real feather in your cap especially with your French on Bastille Day. Here we are back with the main field. Le Mans riding in the third line of riders in that yellow jersey. You can also see Abdou Japarov just behind him in green. Abdou Japarov tried to claim second place in the tour today. He started off well with that first sprint win at Ferrier Bouchard after eight kilometers. But the breakaway fooled him at the second sprint. There's one more sprint to come at Louvigny de Bay but I'm afraid he's not going to be in on that one either now because uh, this breakaway of 10 seems to be establishing itself. Down the centre there, alongside Le Mans, just behind him, Laurent Fignon, who's leaving the Castorama team this year and is still without a contract for next season. Well, as you look down there, it's amazing to see how close all these riders ride together without actually ever touching each other. Le Mans there has got a little bit more space around him. You very often find this when you're the yellow jersey of the Tour de France. The riders are a little bit too scared to get close to you because they're always worried about knocking you off. And that is the advantage of being the top man. There is uh, Vignon coming alongside Le Mans there, just uh, glancing across. Greg having a quick word with him. Well, they want to win the Tour de France, each of them, every one of them, of course. But there's still a breakaway has gone on its way today. None that really affecting the lead at this point. Greg will feel rather happy with the way the day is shaping up. Still a couple of days to go when we go down to the Loire, of course, before the riders are airlifted down to Po on Thursday or Wednesday night, in effect, and then they're into the Pyrenees. Two tremendous days of racing in the Pyrenees, and they really are most difficult uh, routes that the organisation have found this year. The green top jersey, just going to our picture there, of the Gianni Bugno. There's a chance to look at Robert Miller. You can see that he the next support Miller is wearing. He's riding here behind the world champion, Rudy Darnans, and that Robert Miller, who damaged his neck in the crash at uh, Le Arbre. Well, that evening, Robert Miller actually went to see an osteopath, and I think that's the reason he's wearing this neck protection at the moment, because he had some manipulation from uh, an osteopath there, and he's obviously trying to keep his neck warm and make sure that there's no problem. Rudy uh, Darnans yep. here on the front is... Uh, trying to keep the tempo up because there are no Panasonic riders there. You can see Rudy Darnans is in the white jersey with those World, with world Championship bands. He's uh, keeping the tempo up, as I say, because their riders have missed this breakaway. Well, Rudy has also fallen. We've had a crash today, by the way. It happened very early on. Quite a few riders fell down at 75 kilometres. The rider who was a little slow to get back into the action was uh, Alonso, a teammate of Miguel Indurain and Pedro Delgado. But he did remount. His injuries, we've been told by the race doctor, are superficial. And we've caught a glimpse of him earlier on. He's got back into the main field as well. Well, the riders have just gone through the, the sprint there at Louvain de Bay, which is 33 kilometers from the end. And in fact, Laurent Jalabert took that sprint, which is an important thing to note because Jalabert can get a few points back in the points competition at the moment. He's lying in sixth place overall with 100 points compared to the 158 points of Abdi Zaparov. So if he can uh, get up there on the stage today, he can put himself back into contention for that green jersey. And he's a very good sprinter. Well, they talk about him, Paul, as being the next top French rider. He certainly developed over the last couple of seasons as a pro. And to win today, of course, in Rennes, he would certainly cherish that one. Conisher, far side, dropping back a little bit. He had the most bizarre crash in the Tour of Spain. He was riding it so well. And in a very strong crosswind, uh, it was almost gale force, in fact, a metal rod over a metre long uh, flew off the curbside, went straight through his front wheel, ripped out the spokes, he went over the handlebars, and he broke his collarbone in three places. That was a, 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 such a blow to the TVM team in the Tour of Spain, but the major problem was, after that, would he be ready to ride the Tour de France? He is riding the Tour, but this is the first time we've seen him in an attacking move today. And looks like Phil Anderson moving up on the outside. Motorola, of course, not represented in that leading group either. There's Aberdeen. They always seem to give Aberdeen a lot of room, Paul, in the peloton. <laughs> well, yeah, well, he's got a bad repu reputation, though. Abdi Zaparov there, he's knocked a few people off in his time, and he's been disqualified from one or two races. And I think the riders know that he's uh, 
what they call in uh, Holland a quacker can zigzag right the way through the bunch there's a good shot there of the front of the red yellow and green jersey of Gianni Bugno the Italian champion so it looks as though somebody's indicated to Motorola to move men near the front to the chase too many riders at the front have no interest in the chase because there are a lot of teams represented up at the head of the race at the moment Toshiba, Benesto, uh, Lotto, RMO, Carrera they've all got men at the front Ariosti and when you have such a a very breakaway as this you know that there's a lot of riders in the main field will not want to chase and so inadvertently teams are helping one another there's De Klerk, Peter De Klerk, left of our picture he's just gone off it in fact with the polka dot jersey on you can see him now he's the king of the mountains leader he got third place on the only small climb of the day today at the Côte de la Tang won by Aberdeen who was already in the lead at that point ten seconds ahead of Connie Shev and De Klerk led over the main field two minutes and ten seconds back he'll keep his polka dot jersey as we get nearer and nearer the real climbs in this year's Tour de France just to remind you of the King of the Mountains competition that's based on all of the designated climbs each day in the Tour the leading riders score points the man that scores the most points by Paris is the winner of the King of the Mountains strange thing is that all the points added up along these flat stages are about the same as the uh, that a rider can win in just one day when we get to the big mountains there. Indeed, and that's uh, Edwin van Hooydonk, the tallest rider in the breakaway, stretching over the team cars to see nobody sneaking up. There's Bontempi, superb sprinter. Bontempi was at one time one of the fastest sprinters in the world, but the last couple of years he's had a little bit of difficulty. In fact, the last stage he won in the Tour de France, he won it with a lone breakaway on the road to Limoges there. But today he's got number 13 on his back, so maybe that's going to bring him a little bit of luck because, in theory, the fastest man in this breakaway is Henri Abadie. But uh, Bon Tempe is an intelligent rider who's been around for a long time and uh, he could well put be the man to uh, upset the French fans on today, Bastille Day. Johan Brunil, who came to fame in the Tour de France last year when he rode so well in the mountains alongside the top riders. And this year he's won the Grand Prix of Frankfurt and he's finished sixth in the Belgian Classic, what they call the Flesh Wallon, the Walloon Arrow Race. So this is Lely. Lely working very well here. That's the face of Calcaterra. One rider who has nobody's vote today for winning the stage. I'm sure that would boost his morale if he knew that. And this is the Toshiba pair now. This is Aberdeen. They've got three riders in this lead group. So they've got, uh, there's Jalabur, the sprinter, who will try to take the stage when he comes down to it. The bunch moving, I think, now a little bit more purpose. So there's been one or two of the riders not represented in that league group trying to get through to the front, notably the Z team. Well, notably the Z team of Greg LeMond are starting to organise the chase. Not, not a full chase at the moment because you can see everybody there queuing up trying to keep out of the wind. Everybody's trying to find a nice place in the shelter but obviously the Z team are going to have to do this for a lot more days now to come because as Gre Greg LeMond is the leader, it's going to be to these boys that everyone will look to control the race. This is Duke Lola Salle coming to the front here one of the grand old men of the Tour de France, not the oldest because Henke Lubberding is the oldest rider, but uh, Duke La Salle is 36 years of age, which is not a bad old age for a bike rider. It certainly is not, and this is the Tom Tom Tapie team, without their leader Stephen Roach, of course, who went out on the first full day of racing, and the rider coming through here is Francis Moreau, ironically the friend of Stephen Roach, and the confirmation too that 3 minutes 50 is the gap, and they put a minute into this group in the last uh, six or seven kilometers and that sort of riding is uh, going to make it very hard now for the peloton although having said that Paul they are chasing now well the organization is uh, getting getting sorted out there there's one of the Tonton Tapi riders there the front Francis Morrow trying to chase and two Z riders but straight behind them there were the Buckler boys who don't want this uh, breakaway to get caught because they're going to give Edward van Hooydonk all his chances of pulling off a stage victory. Now what's the odds of somebody trying to go alone from this group I wonder because they know they've got Jalabert, Bontempi is likely sprinters, Konishev the first finisher if he's on form. Uh, I would expect one or two riders in that break to try and go alone. 
Well, we can confirm the result of the sprint now at Louvigny. We said Jalabert had won it. Well, in second place was Lely, and in third place was Aberdeen. A two seconds bonus for Aberdeen. So the breakaway goes on. It has a lead of almost four minutes at the moment. So we'll take a break. stage five although to be fair to him the 51 seconds he lost was only half that of some of the men behind him Thursday and Friday were steady days for Lawrence but yesterday's time trial was exactly that and the verdict wasn't good after 73 kilometers he came in 16 minutes and 43 seconds behind the leader Miguel Induran and he is now nearly three quarters of an hour back on the race leaders there's always someone worse off than yourself though and in this case it's at Lake Valswell He's one place behind Lawrence Roach and 193 behind his team leader Greg LeMond, giving Zed the bizarre distinction of having the first and last riders in the race. Ren incidentally has good memories for Greg LeMond. In his comeback tour here in 1989, he won the time trial at Ren and took the yellow jersey for the first time since his shooting accident. That year he went on to the tour as well. Now there are two yellow jerseys up for grabs today, one for the race leader and the other one for the winner of our competition to predict the first man over the line in today's stage. Judging from the post bag, Jean-Paul Van Poppel is the most popular choice, with the rest of the vote split between Sean Kelly, Du Japarov, Johan Muso and Olaf Ludwig. Interestingly, no Frenchman there in the top few guesses, but this is Bastille Day, remember, and if there's one stage a French rider wants to win, it's this one. Whoever wins it, though, will get them and the race leader to sign this shirt before we send it off. For news on who both of those men might be by the end of today, back to Phil. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And by the way, one or two of you rang in and said, what's wrong with Gary's nose of late? Well, I'm afraid he walked into a lamppost carrying a camera on the way to one of his locations. But he'll be fine again shortly. Now back with the action. Here we are. And the race now winding its way in towards uh, Ren through the beautiful department here and in Brittany of course. This is Francis Moreau and this charge by the Tonton Tapi team is having its effect on the leading group of 10 riders. The last time check we had before the break it was 3 minutes 50 seconds. Well we've just had a time check telling us 2 minutes 45 seconds. The time's coming down all the the, the time gap is coming down all the time there as you can see the bunch now starting to string out under the pressure of that chase. The riders here got about 18 kilometers to go as they go through the town of Chateau Giron that was the beautiful chateau we could just see there on the left hand side through the town you see the, the spearhead at the front with the Tonton Tapis boys the Panasonic boys trying to G up this chase Panasonic trying to pull it back together again for their sprinter Olaf Ludwig who still hasn't managed to win that stage that's evading him gendarme again with the yellow flag warning the riders of the traffic islands here always a dangerous moment especially in these closing kilometers as we've seen so often in this year's tour de france riders have been in all sorts of trouble and that little group split off on the left finding it very hard you see the amount of ground they've lost in the head of the field by going on the wrong side but it's the big chase uh, largely by the panasonic team here at the front and this is now the leading group again 10 riders one or two good sprinters here, which leads me to think that there might be an attack from somebody in this group to try and sneak the stage on Bastille Day. The French are represented in the breakaway by Thierry Bourguignon and by um, Laurent Jalabert. Only two in the leading group of ten, and the gap now, Paul, inside two minutes. Coming down all the time. The, uh, the riders in this front group here are working very well together, but there are two or three teams now employing in that chase at the back. So it's going to be very touch and go as to whether they stay away. It, I think they may well get caught just in the sight of the line. I tend to agree now, but earlier I really thought this race had gone, but the Z team were the first to come into the action. Greg Lamont wearing his radio-controlled helmet today where he can speak or at least can hear from the service vehicles behind and his team manager. And some of you might think that's rather unfair, that they can speak to Greg Lamont from the cars, but there's no rule to say the other riders can't wear similar devices. Uh, that's up to them. There's Edwin van Hoyerdonk, who rode so well in the Tour de Flanders when he left the whole race for dead on the last climb and then rode away to a lone victory. But, of course, that was back in April. Form changes, other riders come to form, and now he may not find it quite so easy. Well, as always, Paul, you've raced here in Brittany yourself, especially in the Grand Prix de Rennes. And uh, the crowds... Oh, and somebody's got a flat tyre here. 
Somebody's got a flat, and they're going to be wanting service pretty quickly here because the rider with the flat tyre is Camilo Pastiera. There's his hand up. And so the Gatorade will switch off at the back. Back wheel required. But as I was saying, Paul, the crowds in Brittany and Breton, they really love cycling. Well, this is one of the capitals of cycling as we look here at the, the Norman, who was the leader on his own territory there too, Marie. He's now just in uh, sixth place overall at the moment. Eighth place overall at the moment, sorry. Thierry Marie, who I uh, don't think will climb very much higher up the leaderboard once we get to the mountains. Bernard Vallet, the team manager of Toshiba there, just having a quick word with one of his, uh, one of his men there. That's Henri Abadie, the man with that little bandage on his knee. The reason for that bandage is he had a little bit of a crash a few days ago, and he's got, he can feel a slight tendonitis, so the doctor has strapped it up to try and, uh, try and stop that problem. So let's go back to the main field and the Z team are still very well organized now. There's Robert Miller who must be an extremely uncomfortable in that neck brace and with his right arm bandaged from that fall but he's been riding at the front uh, Paul so I guess his form is good. He's, uh, he's definitely got good form. I only think he's keeping this uh, neck piece on as a little bit of security just so his muscles can uh, heal up a little bit from that manipulation he's had. Miller obviously not shirking, doing a little bit of work at the front there. Robert uh, wanted to get back into shape for the mountains because he's going to be one of the lieutenants of Le Mans when they come to the mountains and his other lieutenant, Adler Kvalsvall, was also the victim of that crash on the first day. So it may be a little bit of chink in the armour in Le Mans' team. Yeah, well, Greg has won the Tour de France on his own before. He had to do it a couple of years back, of course, when he had only one teammate of note, Johan Lambert, stay with him. And he, soon after that, he changed teams. But thank Johan, he took him with him to the new team, which was, of course, the Z team. And so now the leaders here are entering the outskirts of Rennes. They're five kilometres or so from the line. And the gap is now down to one minute and 30 seconds. So it's still touch and go, Paul. Well, it is touch and go. I think at 20 kilometres to go when the riders went through Chateau Giron, I would have said that they were going to get caught, but there's been a little bit of a change in the tactics at the back there. The Panasonic riders deciding not to chase anymore. So the gap went back up a little bit for 10 or 15 seconds and now it's stabilizing at one and a half minutes. Now there's 10 kilometers to go now and it's inside the streets of Rennes and anything can happen really. I think there's going to be an attack once we go around one or two of these corners and the team who will have to do all the work is the Toshiba team because they have three men here plus the fastest sprinter Laurent Jalabert. And that is why Bernard Vallet, the team manager, is up alongside his Toshiba riders there. And I think Paul is telling one of them they must attack. Well, he will be uh, telling them to watch out for the attacks of the other riders. We go under the banner for five kilometres to go. The race is going to be over in something like seven and a half minutes. Ribeiro taking up the back here. Riders still wanting to know from their team managers what the gap is behind because they want to start uh, jostling a little bit for position here, looking for the attack. They don't want to ride as hard as they have been, but always worried about the field coming back from behind. Five kilometres now for the big field. Greg LeMond, as usual, riding at or near the front and keeping out of trouble and the risk of crashing at the back. Well, one kilometre between the main field and that group of breakaway riders. And when they come onto the finishing straight here alongside the river, it's a very long straight and they may well be able to see them at the end. Three kilometres to go now. And we'll begin to go across to the centre of Wren. I think if the Toshibas do lose this day, there'll be a very annoyed team manager tonight with three riders in the breakaway. Yeah, he will certainly expect one of them to win. And Toshiba, a team that's leaving the cycling at the end of the season as well. So the riders, too, thinking of a contract next year, will also want to impress. Everybody really getting nervous. This is a tense time. They've all been together as friends up until now. For the all the, le the length of time the breakaway has been away, they've been working together for one goal, and that's to get to the finish in front of the peloton. Now they become enemies when they have to decide if they can jump away from each other. Jalabert at the front there, Bourguignon coming up to take the pace up again, followed directly by Brunil. It looks to me as though Brunil might have been poised there to go because somebody's gone after him. Uh, Brunil dive for the front there to see the right-hand bend first, or right in the centre now. The railway station is off to our left, and this has locked up the city today on the Sunday afternoon in Rennes. As we go under the two kilometres to go now, it looks as though they're not going to gamble on an attack from the bunch. The Toshibas you can easily pick out are the only riders in this lead with red shorts on. And that's Van Hooydonk slipping away as somebody has tried to clip off the front. Well, that's uh, Johan Brunil. He's been attacking every time the road has gone left or right. 
and he's got a little bit of a lead there but look it's the Toshiba riders who have to do all the work as we drop down here a little bit under the bridge and back up again well, the obvious candidate to do the pacemaking is Tilly Bourguignon or Henri Abadie because the sprinter there wants to try and keep the launch into the finish will be Jalabert but Johan Brunil who's gaining time over Greg Lamont today which might do him well in the mountains when we go down there on Thursday is now trying to win the stage as well and he's got the gap and they may have messed this one up Paul well uh, this is what they had to look out for Brunil is an incredible rider the man we expect to see in the mountains and he's coming up with a fantastic ride here on the flat Bourguignon at the back trying to pull it back together but as soon as if they bring him back if they do somebody else will attack maybe Van Hooydonk who was sat at the back there well, the Belgians are masters of the art of cycle racing in finishes like this. They will have a habit of watching and waiting as we go under the kilometre. They make the move, and Brunel has done that today. He won the tour of the economic community a couple of years ago, which projected him as a future star. He rode his first Tour de France last year, but they're on him. They've caught him at 800 metres, so he's made his effort, and they've taken him. And now it's over to the sprinters once again. They come into the finishing straight now. They're launching the sprint, and Ab and, and uh, difficult to see who's leading out here. It looks like Rubino has pulled away from the front of the bunch in the last few seconds of the race, and he's going like an absolute train. Rubino has gone off the head of the group. Van Hooydonk has locked off the others and isn't going. He's waiting for somebody else to take the move. There is the face of Tilly Bourguignon. He's out of it now. He did the chase to capture the uh, Belgian Brunel, the Rabino, the Brazilian professional. We've never had a stage winner from Brazil in the Tour de France before. And he's gone for it now. He may not be French, but he rides for a French team. And I think he's going to sneak this one right on the line. And Brazil, and there's a turn off for Bastille Day. It's a French team. But is he going to hang on now? As Konishev comes on the left, and the Lauren Jalabert in the middle, and right on the line, he gets it. My goodness me! Lauren Jalabert would have got that race in another two or three metres, but I think he was in second place. Brazil has triumphed in the Tour de France for the very first time. France can take the consolation that at least Moro Ribeiro rides on the French RMO team. And when we see the finish later on in slow motion, I think we'll find that Laurent Jalabert was in second place. So back to the main field. The Lotto boys, who might imagine they've got the winner today in Johan Brunel, but they certainly haven't, are now racing out what is for 11th place. Their big sprinter, of course, is Johan Museo. And will he take on now the green jersey of uh, Abdu Japarov? Because uh, we expect Johan Museo, here he goes on the left of our picture now to try and lead them home. And coming at him too is Etienne de Wilder, the winner the other week, the other day rather. De Wilder on the right, Museo just takes him. And uh, Sean Kelly was alongside Museo as well. So Kelly again finishing in points for the green jersey today. And as Ribeiro comes up to the line, he takes a look over his right shoulder. He sees Laurent Jalabert trying desperately to get on terms for France. Konishev breaks to our left. He continues to look around Ribeiro and then kicks again for the line. Now, does the line come quick enough? Yes, it does. Jalabert will be second and Konishev third. Calcaterra fourth. Here's the result. The Brazilian rider, Moro Ribeiro, just hanging on in the end, pipping Laurent Jalabert and the Soviet Dmitry Konishev. Then comes the three Italian riders led home by Calcaterra, Lely and Bontempi. The main peloton came in just over 50 seconds back and Greg LeMond retains his race leader's yellow jersey. And straight after the finish, Paul Sherwin asked Greg exactly what it's like to control the peloton when you are wearing yellow. It's going to be very difficult for me to control the race and it all depends if, you know, if I have the whole peloton that wants me to lose a race, I'll probably lose a race. If, uh, if, if I have riders that have the same interests for the GC and we're not going to just let people ride away and take four or five minutes, then I could maybe keep my lead. But you know, I always figure if I if I do lose it, it's 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 going to have the pressure. Whoever has it, George is going to have the same pressure. And I'm used to it more than probably anybody. So, who do you see being your main rivals in? I think somebody from Benesto. But I wouldn't put out Bruno and Brookink because Brookink had a very good time trial yesterday and. Uh, he, he, had, he was hurting the last 15, 20 kilometers, but still he's, he's, he's capable of doing very good things. It all depends on how he's climbing. I did, in Tour of Switzerland, I, was, I didn't find him that well in the climbs, but uh, you just can't ever tell. No change in the overall situation tonight. The same names at the top of the leaderboard. But Abdu Japarov in third place has closed into two seconds of Eric Broiking, and he might well move into second place tomorrow if he continues to sprint as well. 
This is the signature of Greg LeMond and the winner today, Mauro Ribeiro of Brazil. And when we've gone back and sifted through the postcards, we'll tell you tomorrow night who will receive this yellow jersey. Tonight here on Bastille Day in Rennes, they are celebrating the first ever Brazilian winner of a stage in the Tour de France. We'll leave you now with the happy smiling face of Mauro Ribeiro. For now, from Gary, myself and Paul Sherwin, goodbye. <laughs>